to Joanna William Wordsworth amid the smoke of cities did you pass the time of early youth? And there you learned, from years of quiet industry, to love the living beings by your own fireside, with such a strong devotion, that your heart is slow to meet the sympathies of them who look upon the hills with tenderness, and make dear friendships with the streams and groves. Yet we, who are transgressors in this kind, dwelling retired in our simplicity among the woods and fields, we love you well, Joanna. And I guess, since you have been so distant from us now for two long years, that you will gladly listen to discourse, however trivial, if you thence be taught that they, with whom you once were happy, talk familiarly of you and of old times. While I was seated, now some ten days past, beneath those lofty firs, that overtop their ancient neighbor, the old steeple tower, the vicar from his gloomy house hard by camp forth to greet me. And when he had asked, am person quo, how fares Joanna, that wild-hearted maid? And when will she return to us? Am person quo. He paused. And, after short exchange of village news, he with grave looks demanded, for what cause, reviving obsolete idolatry, I, like a runic priest, in characters of formidable size had chiseled out some uncouth name upon the native rock, above the Rafa, by the forest side. Now, by those dear immunities of heart engendered between malice and true love, I was not loath to be so catechized, and this was my reply, am person quo. As it befell, one summer morning we had walked abroad at break of day, Joanna and myself. Twas that delightful season when the broom, full flowered, and visible on every steep, along the copses runs in veins of gold. Our pathway led us on to Rotha's banks. And when we came in front of that tall rock that eastward looks, I there stopped short and stood tracing the lofty barrier with my eye from base to summit. Such delight I found to note in shrub and tree, in stone and flower that intermixture of delicious hues, along so vast a surface, all at once, in one impression, by connecting force of their own beauty, imaged in the heart. When I had gazed perhaps two minutes' space, Joanna, looking in my eyes, beheld that ravishment of mine, and laughed aloud. The rock, like something starting from sleep, took up the lady's voice, and laughed again. That ancient woman seated on Helm Crag was ready with her cavern. Hamar Scar, and the tall steep of Silver How, sent forth a noise of laughter. Southern Lowrig heard, and Fairfield answered with a mountain tone. Hell Velling far into the clear blue sky carried the lady's voice, Old Skidra blew his speaking trumpet. Back out of the clouds of Glaramara southward came the voice, and Kirkstone tossed it from his misty head. Now whither, said I to our cordial friend, who in the heyday of astonishment smiled in my face, this were in simple truth a work accomplished by the brotherhood of ancient mountains or my ear was touched with dreams and visionary impulses to me alone imparted, sure I am that there was a loud uproar in the hills. And, while we both were listening, to my side the fair Joanna drew, as if she wished to shelter from some object of her fear. And hence, long afterwards, when eighteen moons were wasted, as I chanced to walk alone beneath this rock, at sunrise, on a calm and silent morning, I sat down, and there, in memory of affections old and true, I chiseled out in those rude characters Joanna's name deep in the living stone, and I, and all who dwell by my fireside, have called the lovely rock, Joanna's Rock. Amperson Quo.